everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Managing Contractors Com Combating Trafficking Compliance. Our CLE team has asked me to cover a few logistical items before I begin the substantive portion. So first, if you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A widget located at the bottom of your screen. I have reserved 15 minutes at the end of the webcast for questions, and we'll try to answer your questions during the webcast or at the end. But if a more in-depth answer is needed or, or we run out of time, I will answer them later via email. Today's webinar is 90 minutes long, and handout materials can be found in the resource widget at the bottom of your screen. The materials include the PowerPoint as well as other materials covering today's subject that you may refer to after the program. This webinar is streaming via the internet. If you have any technical issues during the presentation, check the help widget at the bottom of our screen or hit F5. And this webinar is CLE accredited in California, Illinois, and Virginia for one and a half hours of general CLE credit, and in Missouri for 1.8 hours of general CLE credit. We award CLE based on attendance for the entire 90 minutes. From time to time, you will be required to click a pop-up screen to reflect your continued engagement. At the end of the program, first click on the certification widget at the bottom, which will show if you will be awarded CLE. Then fill in the survey. Once you leave the certification widget, you cannot go back. Your certificate of attendance will be emailed to you in about two hours. Um, for Virginia folks, that will also include the program ID number. And finally, next week on August 21st, Audrey Mintz, a partner in our business litigation practice, will be presenting the second webinar in this series, focusing on general corporate concerns um, related to trafficking. I encourage you to register, and you can do that by going to our website, www.thompsoncoburn.com, and scrolling down on the front page to the lower left where you will, will see TCLE webinars. Hit the blue box, and it will take you to the registration page. Now, to the substance. Um, this program is intended to assist attorneys and others who work for government contractors um, who oversee trafficking compliance for their organization. We will be providing some insights for those who are attending that are in other roles, such as working for the government or who are outside counsel or work with federal grant recipients, but the focus really is going to be on folks who are working um, on compliance from the inside. So before we get started, I wanted to give you all three scenarios to consider and to keep in mind as we go through today's um, webinar. And so take a moment and consider whether or not you think the following activities are going to be prohibited by FAR 52-222-50. The first is a situation where the employee works for the company and supporting a federal award in a country where prostitution is legal. He hires a prostitute to meet him at a hotel after work. The second incident, or the second activity is the company directs potential employees to a doctor for an extensive medical examination, which the company pays the doctor to perform. The company then deducts the examination fee from the employee's paychecks over the first year of performance. The third activity is the company has a number of U.S. citizens working at a Department of Defense base in Europe. The company has incurred significant costs to get an employee to the base. The employee's supervisor is annoyed because the employee wants to return home to be with his family and has quit. The supervisor refuses to have the company pay for his return to the U.S. So consider each of these scenarios as we move through today's seminar. And all of these questions um, are going to be substantive, and we're going to have a couple of polling questions throughout as well to help continue with your engagement. So the objectives for today's seminar really match the registration materials. And I chose these objectives based on common questions I've gotten from clients. And this is an area where compliance has been growing, or compliance concerns have been growing from clients, and on average, I'm seeing about two to three questions a month on this. And as I mentioned, much of today's discussion will be on compliance, but trafficking requirements can impact the contractor's bottom line. And it may be an evaluation criteria, and even recently, the GAO has upheld an agency finding of technical 
unacceptability were offered or did not meet specified trafficking-related or obligations. And today's agenda is going to help us meet those objectives. So for some of you who are really hoping to get into the nitty-gritty of what the FAR requires, we are going to do that, but we have to lay the groundwork first to get to the meat of that discussion, and that's why we're going to have these first two bullet points. So before we get started, I want you guys to take a second and think through what this means and what activities may be considered human trafficking. So take just about 45 seconds and answer this question and we'll come back to the answers in just a second. All right, so let's see what folks came up with. The majority of attendees thought that most, the most likely scenario was forcing someone to work against his or her will. And the other high, next highest one was recruiting a 15-year-old to become a prostitute. So let's see what um, the laws and regulations say. talk about what where the definition of trafficking comes from and that definition can come from multiple places a common question that I often get is what does trafficking mean so a number of entities have defined what trafficking is and some of these definitions that are referenced on this slide the full um, definitions are provided in your written materials in short there is no universal definition of trafficking. There are some commonalities um, that someone is uh, between the definitions, and generally it's when someone is making, saving, or paying money for some type of human provided service, including prostitution. In, U in the US Trafficking Victims Protection Act, there is what is called severe forms of trafficking in person. And that includes the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for one of three things. The first is for the purpose of a commercial sex act in which such an act is induced through force, fraud, or coercion. <clears throat> Excuse me. The second is for the purpose of a commercial sex act and when the person induced to perform such an act is a minor. And third, for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of subjugation to involuntary servitude, peonage, debt bondage, or slavery. So, back to the survey question. It was a bit of a trick question because we hadn't talked about where, what definition of trafficking we were using. But under the severe forms um, of trafficking definition in the U.S.'s Trafficking Victims Protection Act, the most likely choice is going to be recruiting a 15-year-old into prostitution. Um, that's going to be most likely the activity that's considered trafficking that was on that first slide. But what's important for attendees, especially those who are working um, with companies to understand these things, is that you shouldn't assume that everyone is on the same sheet of music. 
you must know what law, regulation, et cetera, you're talking about to really know what trafficking activity is um, for the purposes of the discussion you're having with them. And finally, the, the last takeaway, um, there are three forms of severe forms of trafficking in person in U.S. laws and regulations, and these are going to be relevant to our discussion of the U.S. government's policy because that really starts to set the groundwork for some of the early prohibitions for government contractors. Now, speaking of government policies, most governments have policies um, that attempt to address trafficking by doing one of three things. They are attempting to protect or assist victims, they are trying to prevent and combat trafficking, or they're trying to punish traffickers and those that benefit from human trafficking or that support it. The written details, uh, I'm sorry, the written materials detail the four methods um, that governments often use to implement these policies, and those are up here on the screen as well. Um, and these are, are, are policies that apply generally to companies. They're not specific to government contractors. So oftentimes, um, governments will take efforts to criminalize certain activities. They may then put um, civil liability I'm sorry, on companies. And they may also place civil liability on those same companies for similar violations. And the written materials kind of set out some of the examples of each. Um, and co uh, governments can also then place import restrictions on goods that may be produced overseas using human trafficking or forced labor to produce it. And another thing they can do is having required disclosures. Those disclosures tend to focus on supply chains. As their name suggests, they also are working to increase transparency through disclosures. And that transparency is for consumers to make informed purchasing decisions, such as the California um, statute related to this. And governments generally have these in place because they hope that consumers are going to use their purchasing power to induce companies to change, such as the UK, um, that's one of the, the noted goals for their Modern Slavery Act. But these re disclosure requirements generally don't require affirmative steps to eradicate trafficking from the supply chain um, in the same way that we'll see the, the government contracts obligations do. And what's really important to keep in mind when moving forward is that these mechanisms differ from U.S. government federal contract requirements. And that's really important because one of the things that I've seen in uh, practice is that there are companies, um, whether it's clients or there are subcontractors that believe that they are complying with the FAR requirements because they say, oh, but we're complying with XYZ, and XYZ being the Trafficking Victims Protection Act or the required disclosure requirements. And, you know, they say, well, we've hired an attorney to set up this trafficking program, how many more um, uh, trafficking compliance obligations do we need to have? And the, the answer to that is really, well, you, you have to have a, a compliance program that matches where you're, you have obligations. And each obligation is going to be different, and in particular, those required disclosure laws in the UK, Europe, and California are very different than what um, a company is going to be required to do if they have a federal contract. So the takeaways here, governments can take multiple approaches to addressing tra trafficking. And I apologize, there, there were a couple of uh, um, typos on the screen. I had done this presentation earlier and I, um, I rearranged things to fit and I, I left a couple of typos, so I apologize. But the idea here is that governments can take approaches to address trafficking, um, and each government determines whether to criminalize those activities and what activities are criminal then under their trafficking laws or regulations. Um, additionally, as I was mentioning just a moment ago, the transparency requirements don't require affirmative steps to investigate or in trafficking in the supply chain in the same way that we'll see later. 
um, for government contractors. And finally, the, the last point is something that relates, which is compliance with one government policy or law does not mean compliance with all approaches. So that's really the biggest takeaway here for um, attendees on this section. So why is this a focus of the government? Well, we'll talk about that in the next couple of slides, but we're going to um, talk really about how that information relates to government contractor obligations. And before we do that, I wanted to add one more polling question and ask what part or parts of the FAR describe the trafficking clauses or prescribe the trafficking clauses. So take a second and we'll get attendees to identify whether or not you think the FAR part that covers the trafficking obligations is in part 22, part 25, part 44, or part 47. All right, so 63.2% of you all said FAR Part 22. The next most likely choice was Part 44, and then after that was Foreign Acquisition, and then finally Transportation. So those of you all who are familiar with the FAR numbering system, even if you didn't know this, probably were able to guess that Part 22 is the correct one and that is the application of labor laws to government acquisitions. And I had this as a survey question because I think it helps um, folks who are working with contractors remember really what the government's focus is on this uh, compliance obligation. The government's focus is on labor and employment requirements, and we'll talk about why that is in just a second, but the government imposes very different requirements on its contractors than those mentioned on the previous slides, and the, the focus is on the contractor's own labor and em employment practices. It does also deal with subcontractors and supply chains, but really the heart of this is a FAR Part 22 consideration, labor laws. And so the HR departments at contractors should be um, just as involved in understanding this compliance as they are with some of the other labor law requirements. And so they're going to be just as important, if not more important, to contract compliance than the subcontracting or supply chain folks at a contractor. So why are, la why are these labor considerations important to the government? Um, to, to understand that, it's important to understand the recent history of trafficking and government contracts. In the 1990s, there were some allegations, very public allegations, of foreign worker abuse on government contracts overseas. In the 2000s, there was an, a fair amount of media attention to allegations of trafficking by contractors and subcontractors in Iraq and Afghanistan. And really, throughout that period, most of this activity um, that was brought to the government's attention and brought to the public's attention was focused on the Middle East and what was happening over there on contracts under um, the U.S. government or for the U.S. government. So some of the things that really came about during that time period was that the government was concerned that there were um, persons employed by contractors and subcontractors that had significant labor issues or what the government considered to be um, significant labor issues. These were in the Middle East and often involved third country nationals, so non-U.S. citizens and non-citizens um, of the country in which the contract was being performed. They were being recruited to work in that region. Often they came from India um, under a government contract. And so that's really what started um, and pushed the government to start making some changes to its compliance programs regarding human trafficking. And this history, I think, should help attendees understand 
some of the groundwork and some of the um, obligations as we get to them and why they're in place. So how did we get to them, uh, the current obligations, that is? How did we get to this fairly lengthy FAR clause that we have now? Well, so this image shows a stack of papers under my um, DFARS book, and I have that there to show you that there's a lot of legislative and regulatory history. All of those are printouts of the laws and the regulations um, that have changed since the government first started looking at human trafficking and their government contracts. And there's at least uh, or 20 plus pieces of legislative and regulatory history since 2000. And the following slides and discussion is really just going to give you an overview of some of those regulations, laws, executive orders, and directives. Um, but there are more out there. So first, we'll start with the 2000 Vac Victims of Trafficking and Violence Protection Act. And that's really where a lot of this um, focus from the government started. That statute criminalized certain trafficking activities. Following the enactment of that statute in 2002, so this would have been under President Bush, the White House issued a directive, uh, I'm sorry, President George W. Bush, um, the White House issued a directive that set forth a zero tolerance policy for trafficking by U.S. government employees and their contract and the U.S. government contractors. This zero tolerance policy in the directive um, noted that the government opposes prostitution and related activities. Then in 2003, the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act was passed, and it required a clause in all federal grants, contracts, or cooperative agreements that allowed government termination of those agreements without penalty for severe forms of trafficking, hiring a prostitute during the period of the contract, or using forced labor to perform the contract. Then in 2005, the Department of Defense jumped on um, the bandwagon and issued a proposed rule to start to implement some of these requirements for its, tra uh, for its contractors. That first proposed rule would establish policies and procedures for, uh, or I'm sorry, required contractors to establish policies and procedures, and it required them to notify um, the government of any violations and corrective actions that which were taken pursuant to the clause. Shortly after that, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, or Reauthorization Act, was passed, which reauthorized the original act, and it expanded the criminal jurisdiction to all government personnel and contractors abroad, including others living in their households. Then, the FAR and DFARS councils um, issued interim rules implementing some of these requirements. And the FAR clause, for, or sorry, the FAR case added subpart or 22.17 and 52.222-FAR. So that's really the first time we see the FAR clause on this. And that FAR clause required contractors to notify the contracting officer immediately of information alleging violations, and it also required them to flow down these obligations to their contractors. It was only applicable to non-commercial service um, contracts. At the same time, the DFARS Council issued a, an interim rule that was effective immediately, and it had similar requirements, but it also had some interesting comments that I think will help um, contractors understand what they're required to do now. That uh, interim rule, the, the comments to the, that interim rule noted that contractors should act for violations in an employee's home that there was no time period that the council was giving for acting, um, because if a crime occurred, some of the and some of these activities that are prohibited are considered crimes. Some country, countries may require reporting in less than 24 hours. And the comments also noted that contractors are expected to know the host country laws and regulations related to trafficking and must provide those um, 
laws and regulations to their employees. Then in 2007, the FAR revised its interim rule. The FAR Council realized that some of the things they had originally didn't really match what they were required to have in there given um, the statutory requirements. So that rule then expanded the application to commercial contracts and services. It also deleted some requirements that the FAR Council had originally proposed. And the comments noted um, some items that I think are also helpful for contractors today to understand where the government is coming from. But the comments noted that both lawful and unlawful commercial sex acts are prohibited. Um, they also, the comments also noted that the obligations apply to employees in their post-work time and that a prime contractor's failure to conduct due diligence of a subcontractor could result in action against the prime for a subcontractor violation. The comments also discussed what, um, why there was immediate disclosure required and why that disclosure was required before the contractor would do a full investigation. And it said it's necessary because there are potential outside interests in these um, kinds of allegations. In 2007, the um, trafficking in persons grants and cooperative agreements interim final guidance was also issued. I know that's not on the slide, but I know there are a few attendees that are um, interested in the federal grant requirements, and that added Part 175 to um, sec or to the CFRs um, to CFR Chapter I, and that's what's still in place today. Then in 2009, the FAR Council issued a final rule implementing um, the revised interim rule that had been issued in 2007. And the comments again provide, I think, some helpful context to contractors. And those comments reaffirmed that after hours activities are included in the pro prohibition. They also reaffirmed the importance for a contracting officer to learn of an issue immediately and it reinforced the prohibition on legal commercial sex acts despite um, the difficulty that a contractor may have in enforcing that for its employees. The comments also noted that the um, clause is intended to have an impact on the behavior of government contractor employees. So it's not just, um, the government was basically noting that these are things that contractors are not typically doing, but they are things that the government wants contractors to be doing now as far as preventing trafficking and encouraging and prohibiting, um, I'm sorry, prohibiting their employees from um, participating in prostitution and things of that nature. Then in 2011, the DFARS Council issued a final rule that was effective immediately. And this one isn't particularly um, pertinent to uh, today's obligations, but it is, I think, helpful to understanding what the government is doing now. And what it did was it added surveilling compliance with trafficking as a contract administration function. And this is partly why now a number of defense contractors are seeing queries from their um, COs and from their government clients who are on the, in the Department of Defense, and it's because they're required to um, surveil this compliance as part of their obligations. In 2012, President Obama then issued an executive order, and this executive order required amending the FAR to do a number of different things. And the first thing that the um, FAR would need to be amended to do is to expressly prohibit contractors, subcontractors, and their employees from engaging in four specific trafficking-related activities. And we'll talk about those in, coming up later. But um, the executive order also required amending the FAR to require a compliance plan for certain contracts and it required certifications regarding the compliance plan um, and that the contractor had no knowledge or belief of violations. Following that executive order in 2013, 
the uh, or for fiscal year 2013, the NDAA added very similar provisions. It added provisions that um, required the, the same application that was mentioned in the executive order to grants and subrecipients of grants. And it also included a deadline for the FAR to update the, I'm sorry, for the FAR Council to update the FAR to have those obligations. But beyond the um, similarities to the executive order, the NDAA also had some other provisions and, that are relevant. And those provisions criminalized recruitment, solicitation, or hiring of persons outside of the U.S. for employment on U.S. government contracts, on U.S. military installations or missions, or other property premises owned by the U.S. government outside of the U.S. if the recruitment was done by false or fraudulent pretenses. The NDAA for that year also um, included a requirement, oh, sorry, I already mentioned the requirement about the grants and subgrants. Um, I will note, though, that the requirements as they were stated for the grants and subrecipients of those grants has not necessarily been implemented into CFR. As I mentioned, 2 CFR has not changed since it was um, originally issued in 2007. Then in 2013, the FAR Council implemented those um, proposed, uh, I'm sorry, the NDAA and the executive order. So that's the proposed rule that had all of those trafficking related activities that we now see in the current clause, and that also set forth the first version of the requirements for a compliance plan. And at that time, it was just a proposed rule. Um, the D, D Forest Council also issued a proposed rule, and neither of those yet had been finalized, and we don't get that finalization until 2015. And in 2015, both um, FAR and DFARS had final rules issued, and those implemented the directives from the executive order and the NDAA, and those in particular, the FAR um, final rule that implemented the, the executive order and NDAA have a number of helpful comments um, that provide some answers that a lot of contractors have today about what they're required to do. And in particular, the comments addressed questions related to due diligence, what's meant by due diligence, um, whether or not a um, person um, can be left in a country at the end of employment, in particular a third country national, can be left in a country at the end of employment, the indicators for monitoring subcontractor compliance, the posting requirements, whether or not prime contractors could have a safe harbor for subcon certain subcontractor actions, what credible information is, um, and why this is different than the code of conduct requirements. So if you're ever looking for figuring out what the current clause requires, it's helpful to take a look back at that 2015 um, final rule, the Federal Register um, comments for the final rule. The DFARS also implemented a, their final rule, and the DFARS Council implemented their final rule in 2015 as well. Um, they pretty much adopted the proposed 2013 rule with just a minor edit. So then we're getting up into the, the most recent history. And in 2016, the FAR Council proposed a rule that they knew they were going to propose um, back in 2015 when the final rule was issued. But this proposed rule addressed recruitment fees and provided a definition of recruitment fees, a draft definition, and asked for comments on it. And basically, the definition was provided to help clarify what was meant by recruitment fees that are prohibited under the clause. And in 2018, the DFARS Council actually repealed its provision um, on combating trafficking in persons. And they did that because they said that it was no longer necessary and duplicative of the FAR clause. 
That said, because that was re repealed only in 2018, there are a number of um, master agreements, blanket purchase agreements, or other types of um, IDIQ agreements that have the DFARS clause in it um, and have not necessarily had that clause removed yet. And there are slightly different obligations in there, even though the repeal noted that it's duplicative of the FAR clause, um, contractors should be aware of what that clause requires. Um, and then in 2018, the FAR Council issued its final rule defining recruitment fees. And we'll talk more about what that means in just a moment. So the takeaways. The, the history and evolution of this um, clause can really lead to non-compliance within a company and with, within its supply chain. Um, it's also important for contractors to understand that these anti-trafficking measures have received bipartisan support um, and that the statutory changes often include funding and requirements that relate to training government employees about trafficking. So contractors who are hoping that this obligation is going to go away um, should recognize that really this the enforcement of this has been steadily increasing and that every administration has been paying attention to this. And finally, the last point is that the government understands that these requirements are onerous and that there, it's not necessarily easy for contractors to follow. Um, so to the extent contractors read the obligations and think, well, the government couldn't have intended for us to do this. Well, they actually did. Um, so keep in mind this history as we go through the obligations that are coming up. And also note, though, that this history that I talked about did not include any of the case law interpreting the Trafficking Victims Protection Act definitions that have been incorporated into the FAR clause. So the current clauses, um, are, are, there's really two here. And the government uses both to basically require contractors to take certain actions from the time of the proposal period through the entire performance of the contract. Um, we're going to provide a detailed overview of these clauses, but the, the slides and materials are crafted to make sure the information is accessible, and I haven't quoted all of the language from the clauses, so make sure, if, if you're ever trying to understand what the clause requires, make sure to go back and read and understand all the aspects, and also continue to check for updates. As I've mentioned before, this is an area where the government has been paying attention, and there's a lot of history because um, the clause is constantly changing. And although um, the FAR 52-222-56 clause, which is the certification for uh, this in solicitations, although that comes first in the process, we're going to start out with the other clause because some of the requirements that are addressed in the certification are described better in the um, FAR 52-222-50 clause that is actually in the contract. So, the current clause, um, it applies to a government contract or a subcontract, and it has a number of required actions. There's really five required actions here, and I'll give you guys just a second to read through them. 
All right, so hopefully you've figured out now that there is no threshold to the application and that the required actions really cover only five different things. But what is important for contractors to understand is these are really the only five explicit requirements. There are going to be prohibited activities in the policy that also reflect things that contractors really are also required to do. So what are these prohibited activities? There are the three activities that were originally prohibited in the FAR clause that still exist, and those are the ones listed on the screen. Um, but what's important to understand from a broader perspective is that prohibited activities now are trafficking-related activities. It's not just trafficking that's prohibited. But these are the three definitions that were originally in the FAR clause and that are also addressed in the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. So considering um, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act and these prohibited activities, I wanted to give you a hypothetical and um, have you all think through how this hypothetical could come out. Consider that your company, we'll, we'll call your company Craft Patriots Co., is performing multiple large government contracts in the New England area. And your CEO, who we'll call Robert Kraft, goes to a Florida massage parlor and solicited prostitutes there. You learn about this because your CEO, Mr. Kraft, was caught on video during a police sting. Were his actions prohibited activity under the FAR clause? Um, I know there's not a poll, with, um, poll up on the screen, but just out of curiosity, can some folks put answers in the Q&A widget telling me whether or not you think his activity was prohibited, and if so, why or why not? All right, so his activity would fall under what we have on the screen here as far as um, procuring commercial sex acts during the period of performance of the contract. That's something I think most of you all picked up on. Um, but what's not up on here is who is prohibited from doing these activities. And the policy um, that's in the FAR clause starts out by saying contractors, contractor employees, and their agents shall not and then do these things. So then the question is, we know that there was a commercial sex act that was procured during the performance of the contract. So is Mr. Kraft an employee? Well, probably not. Um, the definition in the FAR clause ties employees to the contract performance, and generally they're folks who are directly engaged in performing the contract. So he's not necessarily prohibited from doing it as an employee, but is he an agent? of the contractor, and probably yes. The FAR clause defines agents to include directors and officers, and Mr. Kraft would probably be considered an officer of the um, company of Kraft Patriots Co., so he would be prohibited from doing that activity. And if then your company finds out about this police sting and his arrest, the company is then going to have to um, provide notification to the contracting officer and IG under the explicit requirements of the FAR clause. So now let's talk about some of the other prohibited activities. And these are really the ones, as the history shows, that became the focus of the government after 2011-ish, um, 2013. And that's when the government, um, the government being the White House and Congress started to really focus on activities related to labor and, and employees. And the activities that are now prohibited that relate to recruitment are using misleading or fraudulent practices, using recruiters that don't comply with local, local labor laws, charging recruitment fees, and we'll talk about what that means, what a recruitment fee is in just a moment and failing to provide a recruitment agreement as may be required. So that last one is really, again, 
one of those prohibited activities that puts an actual affirmative obligation on contractors. What it means is that contractors are going to have to provide a recruitment agreement if it's required by certain laws um, or by a contract with somebody. The FAR clause then um, addresses not only activities related to recruitment, but activities related to employees after they've been recruited and have become actual employees of the contractor. And what it prohibits then is the contractor um, cannot restrict access to an employee's documents, and those are documents such as passports, immigration documents, and things like that. Contractors also cannot, uh, contractors, contractor employees, and their agents cannot fail to provide or pay for return transportation as required. Um, they're also prohibited from providing or arranging substandard housing and prohibited from failing to provide an agreement as required. And the document must meet certain standards if an agreement is actually provided. So again, this list has items that even though they're prohibited activities, the double negative actually places affirmative requirements on contractors. This means that a contractor has to provide or pay for return transportation unless certain exceptions are met. And it also means that a contractor has to provide an agreement with certain standards in it if there is some law or contract that requires uh, an employment agreement. And so what that means is employment agreements have to have certain items in them um, per this FAR clause. Additionally, the providing or arranging substandard housing also meet uh, the prohibition on that also means that contractors have to provide housing that meets certain local standards and that they have to make sure that the housing actually um, does what it intends for it to do. And by does what, I, it, what the contractor intends for it to do, I mean it's clean, it is safe, it is roomy, um, and the FAR clause doesn't have um, specifications is what that means, but when you look at some of the earlier guidance from the Department of Defense and Department of State, you'll see that generally neither likes housing that is less than 50 square feet per person. Um, it doesn't have to be single room housing, but there are certain things that the government wants to see when it's looking at housing um, under this clause. So now we're going to talk about recruitment fees. The, this is, once again, the change that came down in 2018, or that was finalized in 2018. Um, I believe it actually took effect in January of this year. But this is a change that I think a number of contractors are still wrapping their heads around what it means and what a recruitment fee is. But the FAR now defines a recruitment fee as a fee of any type that includes charges, costs, assessments, or other financial obligations that are associated with the recruiting process and that are charged, regard and, and they're considered recruitment fees regardless of the time, manner, or location or imposition of the collection of the fee. The clause has a, a lengthy description of some of the things that are included in um, the definition of recruitment fee. But some of the ones that I'll call out to you all are ones that I think contractors have struggled with understanding just based on my conversations with um, folks in the industry. These are fees that are associated with the recruiting process for processing applications and petitions, for acquiring visas and fees associated with those visas, for acquiring photographs and identity or immigration documents such as passports, um, and any fees associated with those. For accessing the job opportunity, which includes required medical examinations and immunizations, background reference and security checks um, and examinations, and additional certifications. All of those things are fees that the contractor cannot charge um, potential employees or employees um, for part of the recruiting process. 
uh, recruitment fee also is going to be considered a, or a fee is going to be considered a recruitment fee regardless of whether the payment is paid directly in property or money, um, regardless of whether it's deducted from wages, regardless of if it's collected by the employer, the contractor, or a third party, um, and including the, the third party, included in that third party definition are agents, labor brokers, and recruiters. So it, it's a pretty broad definition of what is included in a recruitment what a recruitment fee is, and it's also pretty broad as far as whether or not it's considered a recruitment fee based on who's collecting it. Now we're going to talk very briefly about the compliance plan, um, which is required for any portion of the contract that is for supplies, including commercial items that are acquired outside the U.S. and have an estimated value exceeding $500,000, um, and also for services that are going to be performed outside the U.S. and have an estimated value exceeding $500,000. And this is a question that I often get, which is, do we have to have a compliance plan? And so this is really what the FAR says on this slide. The next slide, though, I think clarifies really more of what it is. Uh, or when a contractor is required to have a compliance plan. Because I, I think once you understand who does not have to have one or what portion of the contract does not have to have one, that helps um, contractors really understand when they do need to have one. Um, so a compliance plan is not required for any portion of a contract that's for COTS supplies. Um, they also don't have to have a plan for a portion of the contract that has supplies or services that are valued at five hundred thousand or less. If the supplies, they don't have to have a plan if the supplies are acquired from the United States, or if the services are going to be performed in the United States. So this really, again, is just to give folks an idea of when they need to have a, a plan. One of the common questions that I have gotten is, what should be in our compliance plan? And there's really five basic elements. Um, and only one of those focuses on supply chain. Again, you know, this really evidences the government's focus on labor laws and um, related programs. But the, the five elements for the compliance plan are an awareness program, a process for employees to report without fear, a recruitment and wage plan, a housing plan, and procedures to prevent trafficking in the supply chain. I'm not going to go into detail of, of these requirements because, in all honesty, I could spend 90 minutes or more on just the compliance plans alone. Um, but if your company must or chooses to have a compliance plan, there is a checklist of FAR requirements in the written materials. And contractors should review the FAR requirements. And also, there are model compliance plans out there. The Aspen Institute, in conjunction with another um, entity, developed a model compliance plan at, um, under a government contract. The Department of State paid them to develop a model compliance plan that contractors could use. Um, so you can also look at that when you're um, building your compliance plan. So we'll address these plans, again, in the best practices. But again, like I said, I'm not going to go into the details of what to have in your plans for this seminar. I will end the, this discussion, though, by saying just because you're not required to have a plan doesn't mean a contractor shouldn't consider having one or that the contractor shouldn't talk through the required aspects. These are, the, the plans really just address a, a mechanism for contractors to meet certain FAR obligations that are addressed elsewhere and to it's just not a bad idea to have them um, in, in place generally, but the contractors also can use them and have them ready should they ever need one um, for proposal purposes. And the last thing I'll talk about with this clause is, are the remedies. And the FAR clause specifies a number of remedies for failing to comply with the obligations. And I'll give you guys just a second to read through those. 
So at, at the at bottom of the slide, you'll notice I mentioned that there are other remedies available to the government. Um, some of those could be a False Claims Act suit, uh, a determination not to award future contracts, um, and they could do that because they evaluate prior compliance um, as part of a contract award, um, or just even considering negative past performance determinations for prior vi violations. Um, and the government does use these remedies. The State Department issues a trafficking in persons report every year, and the most recent one noted that the Department of Defense had, in fiscal year 2018, had issued non, nine non-compliance requests, four cure notices, one show cause letter, one contractor personnel termination, six contractor employee debarments, one subcontractor debarment, and one contractor termination for violating um, the government's trafficking policy or anti-trafficking policy. Um, it, the, the number of, or the variety of remedies was a bit higher than what the Department of State reported in its report for fiscal year 2017, um, but the, the number of violations probably is somewhat similar. Um, in that year, the, gov the State Department reported that the Department of Defense had had 22 suspensions, six debarments, one job termination, and one compliance agreement for um, violations of the government's trafficking, anti-trafficking policy. So here is a slide on the FAR 52-222-56 clause. And this is the one in solicitation. So I'll give you just a second to read through some of the um, aspects of this clause. So before I get to the certification um, clause that's up on your screen, there was a question about what the violations were for the um, reported, uh, for the remedies that were reported in the State Department um, trafficking in persons report. The report doesn't list what those violations are. Um, there have been, I think, some efforts to uncover exactly what those violations are by some of the government watchdogs, um, but I don't know off the top of my head what exactly the violations involved. So the current certification clause applies to solicitations and this, what it does is it requires contractors to provide a pre-award certification that states that they have implemented a compliance plan and that they've conducted due diligence. The reason earlier than why I referenced, uh, or earlier I mentioned that contractors may want to consider having a compliance plan even if they're not required to have it because they may want it later for proposal purposes. And I say that because anybody who's worked at a contractor where they are trying to put together a proposal understands that everything is focused on the business side at that point and that it can be very hard to put together a, a plan of, of compliance for a specific proposal. So at the very least, if your company has talked about some of the elements that are required for a compliance plan, um, and ha has an idea of what you would put in your plan, it makes it so much easier to submit that pre-award certification um, that you have a compliance plan in place because you're going to be able to put that plan in place much more quickly. Um, it also helps the contractor have a much better idea of what they can be doing and what they need to do for the due diligence for the specific contract. Because once again, you're certifying that you've conducted that due diligence and you want to make sure that you have an idea of 
um, what your company should be doing to make that certification. I will say one of the common questions um, we've gotten about this is what is meant by due, di due diligence, and that's something that is not required just before the award, but it's also required annually. It's addressed in um, FAR 52-222-50. Um, but if you look at the history, what due diligence requires it really depends. In, in the pre-award stage, that may mean reviewing a subcontractor's compliance plan if they are required to have one. Um, during the performance of the contract, it may require direct interaction with the subcontractor or the subcontractor employees um, on these trafficking-related activities. And that's really information that comes from the regulatory history, some of the Federal Register comments um, on early, some of the earlier versions of the FAR clause. I note that the clause does not prohibit the government from asking for compliance plans or parts of a plan to be submitted and evaluated per the solicitation. Um, the government can even set forth requirements for what it wants to see in the plan, and it can find an offeror to be technically unacceptable if it fails to meet those requirements. And just recently, very recently, in fact, on July 31st, the GAO issued a decision where the agency had determined that an offeror was technically unacceptable because it failed to meet requirements um, related to information that the government wanted to see in the proposals regarding a housing plan and recruitment and um, labor practices, essentially. The, the contractor or the offerors were expected to provide information on the food that they would provide to employees or the stipend that they would provide to employees and to explain why the um, stipend could cover basically a healthy square three meals per day and I think maybe even snacks, um, as well as whether or not their housing that they would provide would meet the local uh, or would meet certain requirements or whether the stipend that they would provide their employees to find their own housing could meet um, similar requirements. And one contractor did not provide that information and provided very low um, sums as estimates for those stipends, and the government had found the offeror to be technically unacceptable, and the GAO upheld that decision. So now that we've talked about really what the clauses require, we'll talk briefly about some best practices. And these best practices come from my own experience, but also from a couple of government documents that I think really help shed light on what the government is expecting contractors to do here. Um, the documents and the written materials include a Department of Justice uh, include references to a Department of Justice document that would apply um, if DOJ ever has to review a contractor's compliance um, for allegations of criminal um, misconduct, but also they include references from an Office of Federal um, Procurement and Policy document that provides best practices and mitigation techniques for contractors. And that was a document that was really created to provide guidance for contractors, but also to provide guidance to agencies and contracting officers when dealing with reported incidents, um, acquisitions that have a high risk of trafficking, and the evaluation of past performance when the risk of trafficking was high in the acquisition. So, the, you know, the best practices that I'm going to talk about really encompass um, my own experience as well as the, the themes from those documents. And really, the overarching theme from both the Department of Justice and OFPP are that the, the main theme, I think, is that there should be a cycle for policies, procedures, and plans at a contractor. They, both the government and its enforcement arm, Department of Justice, really expect these to be living documents. They want to see that the contractor has developed um, policies, procedures, and plans based on a company-specific assessment and risks that are specific to the company as well as the contract. 
So for instance, if they, the work is in labor intensive industries, such as construction, food service, janitorial services, um, those things, the contractor needs to develop the policies, procedures, and plans to address those aspects um, when considering what's required by the FAR clause. Um, also, they expect to see that when a contractor is implementing these things, the policies, procedures, and plans, that they are implementing them through tailored mod training, tailored training, um, and that the reporting is something that fits with the contractor's work. And the, the last kind of area of this cycle is review. Both OFPP and DOJ expect that contractors are regularly reviewing these policies, procedures, and plans, and reviewing them when issues arise. So then once they review them, then they would develop new policies and procedures and plans or revise them. But either way, this is a cycle that the government expects contractors to be doing. It's not just a one-time compliance program that you put in place and never look at again. It's something that the government wants contractors to be um, continually working at throughout the, the life of their government work. And contractors have asked, you know, are companies actually doing this? Are they, I mean, most, con you know, what I hear sometimes is, I know most contractors have just developed these compliance plans and put them in a drawer and nobody's thought about them. That's true. There are, there are a number of companies and contractors that have done that. But there's also a number of contractors that are doing this. Even if they don't have a formalized policy to go through this cycle, they are doing it. And, and that's really a, a big part of why I've started to get a number of these questions over the last, I would say, year or year and a half. Um, because contractors are starting to at least review their policies, procedures, and plans, and then realize maybe we need to update them. And so this is something that I see contractors doing. And again, because the government is focusing on this more, you know, contracting officers or the contracting administration um, departments at the government customer, at your government customer is paying more attention to this. They're asking questions about it. And there, there's a significant amount of federal funding that is going to educate the government employees about this. I didn't address it in all of the history, but a number of the statutory reauthorization acts um, included funding for um, providing further education to government folks. So that's why we are seeing a desire from the government side um, for contractors to be doing these things. And the, the next overarching theme that I'll talk about from the best practices side is that effective implementation really requires buy-in and it requires early input from multiple units. Um, the ones that I have on this slide are just a handful of the ones that probably have to have buy-in. They're probably also the main ones, but this is why I think there's sometimes some struggles from contractors to comply with these obligations. And it's because only one of these units has been tasked with um, this FAR 52-222-50 compliance, and they're not really working with all of these other units to come up with the program that the contractor has. And so then the contractor isn't necessarily doing everything um, that they want to be doing or that they could or should be doing. But what are some of the things that each of these units should be or could be doing? Um, for instance, HR is likely going to be the department that is in charge of drafting uh, specific employment agreements. You know, legal department may actually draft them, but HR is amending them and revising them or modifying them. I guess that's probably the better word, modifying these agreements for specific employees. And so they have to understand what they're required to have in their agreements under the FAR clause and, and what's um, specifically required for those employment agreements. The HR department is also providing information to recruiters and they're providing um, training and awareness programs on these issues. The HR department is also in the first stop at ensuring that recruitment fees aren't paid to potential employees. 
And it's also the department that's probably in charge of or should be in charge of tracking local labor and trafficking laws. So for contractors that are performing overseas, the HR department is probably going to be the one that is um, at least has an idea of what they, they have to be doing um, from a labor side overseas. The subcontracts side may be the team that is drafting recruitment agreements. And again, there's FAR obligations related to those recruitment agreements. That team is also the one that's probably ensuring that clauses are flowed down to subcontractors. That's the team that's probably obtaining subcontractor certifications related to the compliance plans and due diligence. And it's also the team that's probably or should be conducting pre-award due diligence of subcontractors. Um, the program team, that's probably going to be the folks that are affirming, affirming that due diligence has been completed throughout the life of the contract. It's also the team that's probably overseeing housing um, if it's provided by a contractor. And it's also the team that's making sure that the compliance plan is posted where it should be and may be the one that is monitoring subcontractors for potential violations of the government's policy. And finally, leadership. This is the team that you know has to approve any policies and procedures. If a contractor is going through that life cycle of updating its policies, procedures, and plans, these are the folks that have to sign off on it. So they need to have an idea of what the FAR requires of contractors. These are also going to be the folks that have to give the go-ahead on providing a, a notification to the um, contracting officer and inspector general. So these folks probably also need to have an understanding of what immediate means from the FAR perspective um, for the, the trafficking obligations. And probably if they're used to the mandatory disclosure requirements under the FAR for the Code of Business Ethics and Conduct, probably also need to have an understanding of how this is different than the disclosure requirements there. Um, and fi finally, the leadership leadership team needs to know that the policy applies to them. Again, this is not just a subcontracting or a supply chain issue. This is something that applies to um, all agents and employees where agents can be officers and directors. And finally, the, the compliance and legal team is probably the, includes the folks that are preparing policies, procedures, and plans. And they're also the folks who are probably answering the day-to-day -day questions on these things, which is why I think a number of you all have tuned in today to get an idea of how you can answer these questions for your employees and your officers and directors. But those are the different units that are going to be involved in implementing a compliance program here. And it's really important then to think about this kind of as a, a multi-unit coordination because that makes it very, very difficult for contractors to put together a compliance plan during the proposal process. And contractors, you know, depending on what the proposal, or I'm sorry, the solicitation requires, contractors may be able to put together a, a bare bones plan. But as I've mentioned before, some of the agencies, depending on the industries, um, that are going to be covered by a contract, some of the agencies may have specific requirements for these compliance plans, and contractors should be ready to address those um, when they see them in their solicitation so that they can quickly move through the compliance aspect and get to the business side of what they want to be doing. So now we're going to go back and end with a discussion of the activities we talked about at the very beginning. And hopefully, um, based on our discussion, you have an idea now of how the government's going to view the three activities that we talked about then. So the first one, an employee works for the company in supporting a federal award in a country where prostitution is legal. He hires a prostitute to meet him at a hotel after work. Is this an activity that's prohibited by the FAR clause? Yes. Um, under FAR 52-222-50B2, a contractor employee has procured a commercial sex act and that's prohibited by the um, provision. Next, a company directs a potential employees to a doctor for an extensive medical examination. 
which the company pays the doctor to perform. The company then deducts the examination fee from the employee's paychecks over the first year of performance. Is this prohibited by the FAR clause? Again, yes. This, um, the updates to the FAR clause at the end of 2018 defined recruitment fees to include fees for accessing the job opportunity, including required medical examinations and immunizations. Thus, this um, fee would fall under that category. I would also note that depending on the cost of the examination, the government or an employee may be able to argue that um, he or she was induced to incur substantial debts that's going to have to be repaid through work, which could be considered forced labor. There is um, a, a case from the Eastern District of Louisiana that was considering forced labor and um, these kind of, not medical examinations, um, but just the kinds of debts that employee or potential employees may incur that they then have to repay through employment. And it's worth considering how payments um, that are going to be deducted from an employee's paychecks are not only violations of the trafficking um, clause, but also potentially could relate to the Trafficking Victims Protection Act if, if those fees in particular start to get very high. And then finally, the last activity we discussed was a company has a number of U.S. citizens working at a defense base in Europe. The company has incurred significant costs to get an employee to the base and the employee's supervisor is annoyed, somewhat understandably, because the employee has quit a month after arriving because the employee wants to return home to be with his family. The supervisor refuses to have the company pay for his return to the U.S. Is this a violation of the FAR clause? Again, yes. Um, the FAR clause requires contractors to pay for or provide return transportation unless there are certain exceptions that apply, and this would not be one of them. Um, the clause does not provide an exception for instances where an employee quits. So before um, we get to any last minute questions from um, attendees, just to provide a quick summary of what we talked about. First, it's important for contractors to understand and remember that the FAR clause requires specific actions from contractors and it prohibits trafficking-related activities. And I highlighted uh, or emphasized trafficking-related activities because it's really important to remember that it's not just trafficking itself that is prohibited by the FAR clause, but it's also um, trafficking-related activities. The next point is that um, common areas of noncompliance can be addressed by making sure that policies, procedures, and plans evolve and address um, change laws and, and regulations. This really gets to you know, part of the um, best practices that we talked about towards the end, but it's also one of those things that you know, hopefully after attendees um, leave this seminar or this webinar, they you know, go back and think through how um, they, they might be able to address some of the common areas of noncompliance in, in their own companies. But some of the areas of noncompliance or common areas of noncompliance that we talked about are employees or contractors' belief that compliance with another policy or, or law is the same as complying with the U.S. government contract requirements. Um, another common area that can result in noncompliance is um, the compliance is left to one unit that hasn't gotten others involved. Um, in particular, the HR department has not been fully involved. And um, some of the questions then that we've talked about, some of these we've talked about explicitly, others have been implicitly discussed, but these are also common questions that employees have given to um, their compliance or legal team related to this clause. And that, you know they're trying to get an understanding of what is trafficking. We talked about that at the beginning. We also talked about why contractors have to do this. Um, this really, you know, is a labor-related concern from the government. Um, we also talked about 
what do contractors have to do to provide employees um, notice of the policy and potential action. Um, that's something we just kind of implicitly talked about. But what they have to do is provide some notification to, um, to the folks. And it can be through a code of conduct. It could be through um, an awareness program. It could be through a number of different methods. Um, but there, there has to be some kind of notification provided. Um, we also talked about when a contractor has to have a compliance plan as well as when they may want to have a plan. Um, we briefly touched on what has to be in the plan. Like I said, the written materials discussed that a little bit further. And also another common question that we talked about is what is due diligence? And again, when um, folks who are in-house that are dealing with answering this question for their employees um, get these questions, the legislative and regulatory history provide a host of um, guidance on how to answer these or how you might want to answer these. Um, but there is also case law, especially if it's a forced labor question, that is going to really guide whether or not um, something uh, is considered a trafficking-related activity. So finally, um, we've got about nine minutes left. Uh, if you have any questions, please put those into the widget at the bottom of your screen. I have a, a couple of questions here, um, as well as some common other questions that I've gotten that I'll answer if folks don't have any specific questions they want to ask. So the first question that I have is, does the FAR clause provision on recruitment fees prohibit an employee from hiring and paying a recruiter who helps the employee find a job or secure a job? Basically, can the employee hire a legal recruiter? Um, the FAR provision um, would not prohibit such a, an activity. Um, again, the FAR clause on that defines a recruitment fee as something that is paid um, by the employee to certain people, and that is basically to the contractor or somebody that's representing the contractor. So assuming that the legal recruiter is not um, being employed by the contractor or is not um, affiliated with the contractor, that should be fine and um, that would not be a prohibition. So some of the other questions, um, what does immediately mean? Uh, again, the history provides some guidance on this, but there isn't a time frame stated in the clause of what um, is meant by immediately in terms of the notification that has to be provided to the contracting officer and the inspector general's office. The regulatory history does show, though, that um, part of the reason they haven't included a time frame is because there may be some reports that have to be made to local authorities in a, a certain time frame. And that time frame may be much shorter than what the government um, may anticipate seeing for a typical uh, um, violation notice. And, and in particular, the regulatory history referenced that there are some local laws that require um, less than 24 hours notice of violations of these activities. So basically, um, what I would interpret that to mean is that if there is a violation that occurs and you're going to have to notify local authorities within 18 hours, you want to notify your government customer at the same time or if not before then. Um, the government also wants to have access to this information and wants to know about the violation before outside um, parties do. So to the extent there is going to be outside interest in um, the violation, if, for instance, there's going to be media coverage, you know there's going to be media coverage, or you suspect that there's going to be media coverage of the incident, you want to make sure your government customer knows about it before they read about it in the news. Um, additionally, I, I note again that the government has um, made it clear that they do not expect a full investigation to happen before the notification. This is not like the mandatory disclosure requirement that occurs when there's credible evidence. This is credible information. 
Um, and that's when the government wants to know about it is just when there's going to be credible information that could be out there um, or that you have. And just um, on that same note, there's a common question about what is credible and what is credible information. The regulatory history, again, provides some good um, guidance on this. And they note, again, that this is not credible evidence, but that it is, and in quotes, believable information. And that the contractor should not wait for um, ev credible evidence via an investigation before reporting. And another question that we often get related to compliance plans are, how many plans do we have to have? Um, we only have to have one plan, that's right. Generally, you can have one plan as long as it covers all of your contracts and, or the required portions of your contracts, at least. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that the plan has to be appropriate for the contract. Um, and so there's usually mechanisms uh, for contractors that do have a, a single compliance plan that applies to their contracts generally, what we see is that there's a mechanism that those large contractors have to tailor a company-wide plan to a specific contract. And generally, those mechanisms are going to cover the recruitment and wage plan and the housing plan um, because those are going to be things that are going to be specific to the contract. The recruitment and wages are probably going to have to um, at least consider local labor laws and the housing plan is certainly going to have to consider what um, type of housing, if any, is provided to contractor employees under the contract. Um, a, a related question regarding compliance plans is whether contractors really have to post this um, to the website or the work site. There's contractors that um, have mentioned it's quite onerous to, to do this. And I, the regulatory history acknowledges that to some extent, especially in some of these um, contingency areas or areas that are in, in the Middle East um, that are out in the middle of a desert. It can be very difficult to post a, a, compliant, a trafficking compliance plan to the work site. What the history shows is that the website doesn't have to be a public one, so yes, the compliance plan does have to be posted to your website, um, but it can be an internal company website. Um, and the, the plan has to be posted to the work site only if it's practicable. So if, for instance, you're in the middle of a desert and there is no place for you to post this other than a, uh, a teeny tiny plant, the, the only plant in the desert, that's not going to be practicable. And so what a contractor is going to do in that situation is provide it to any employees um, that are working under it. So just finding a different way to get the information to the employees if you can't post it. And I, I think the final question that we've gotten often, and this has been in particular at, at, over the last couple of years, is what does the Department of Defense require on this? Does the Department of Defense require anything different? And hopefully, from the earlier history, you gathered that the Department of Defense used to require a, a number of different things, but they repealed the DFARS clause that addressed this in 2018. Um, that said, there is still some um, guidance out there from the Department of Defense that is still part of the DFARS on this that does provide some helpful insight into what the Department of Defense may consider is um, sufficient for certain aspects. Again, the 50 square feet for housing per employee is something that is, is referenced in the DFARS guidance. Um, but there's nothing that is required by these items. So that really takes us to the end. If you have any other questions, please um, feel free to reach out. I um, my, my contact information is in the written materials. Um, but oh, I, I did get one more question that I'll answer before we head out. And that is, what is the process for submitting the required certification? Are these in SAM? The certification is generally going to be included in the solicitation itself. Um, 
it, you'll see, it, and, and we've seen in a number of solicitations, um, the government calls out FAR 52-222-56, and that's going to be the pre-award certification. And there is, however, a certification that is encompassed in FAR 52-222-50, and that is considered to be a um, the way most contracts, and I, I believe SAM itself, frames it is by updating your SAM um, certificate reps and certs that you're agreeing that um, you have done this for all of the covered contracts that require such a certification. Um, so it may not be a direct certification that is handed to the CO. However, there may be instances where they are asking for that. Um, just based on experience, the, the CO may ask for um, a, a certification separate and apart from SAM. Um, but that really, again, takes us to the end of the session. Thank you so much for participating in today's webinar. Um, I invite you to complete and submit the survey that's located in the widget at the bottom of your screen um, and doing that after you have done the certification um, aspect of it. We really do value your opinions and appreciate your participation in today's CLE course. Uh, again, if you don't have if you have questions that you did not have answered, my contact information is in the written materials. And thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.